If you put together the words nursing, education, rural, and Wyoming, you have the core of what has been important to Mary Berman's career. She came to uh, University of Wyoming in 1992 as an assistant professor. What followed was a continual string of research grants and projects, publication, and community involvement. She's been especially active as a volunteer in Laramie's downtown clinic, which serves the medical needs of the, country, of the county's poor citizens. Since becoming the dean of the nursing school in 2008, she has led several statewide projects aimed at improving healthcare and nursing education in Wyoming. These include the Nursing Workforce Task Project, I'm sorry, Nursing Workforce Project of Wyoming, the Nursing Education and Leadership Project in Wyoming, the Wyoming Center for Nursing and Healthcare Partnerships, and she has just recently begun the two-year project Revolutionizing Nursing Education in Wyoming, which is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Let me end by observing that UW's nursing school, which Dr. Berman heads, trains 700 students each year. The majority of these students are learning in their own communities across Wyoming, working in partnership not only with the university, but also with the community colleges and with local hospitals and clinics. The graduates go straight into nursing jobs where they make up the backbone of Wyoming's healthcare network. I give you Mary Berman, nurse, doctor, professor, and dean. Thank you, Paul, um, and good morning. I wasn't sure if there would be a connection between what Mark was gonna talk about and what I'm gonna talk about, but I was thrilled to hear that he was once thinking about being a medical illustrator, so I think that's the connection, and <laughs> maybe Tony will talk about hospital or primary care architectural design, and we'll tie all three of them together. Um, I'm not actually gonna talk about much about Obamacare. When, when Paul asked me to do this some time ago, I made up a broad title that would allow me to do something, but I wasn't exactly sure what it would be. Um, and as, we get, as I got closer to today, I really thought what I really wanted to do is something a bit different. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of get Obamacare out of our system here at the beginning. And then we're gonna look forward. As my title says, where do we go from here? Um, so we'll, we'll spend just a little bit of time, but not much on those issues. What I really wanna do today um, is, I'll give you a quiz, because Paul said that we should get you actively involved, so I have a quick quiz for everybody here at the beginning. And it has a couple purposes. One is to, again, sort of get our angst about healthcare out of our system. Um, and help us focus on the fact that our healthcare system, quite frankly, is not sustainable in our country. So we'll focus briefly on that. We're gonna examine models of care, focusing particularly on primary care, that I think will work to help us make meaningful change in our healthcare system. And we'll talk briefly about what the triple aim is. It's a, an initiative uh, nationally. And then we're gonna discuss some takeaway messages about Wyoming, and I hope to hear from all of you on that particular part of it. And I'm gonna offer a challenge at the end, something I often do for our students. And I put this slide in here purposely. This is actually an older slide. You'll see it references Hillary Clinton. So this goes way back to the 90s. We were already unbelievably polarized about healthcare at that time. We are far more po polarized at this time than we were back then. Um, it is difficult to talk about healthcare at this particular point. Um, so I, like I said, I'm hoping we can move away from that piece of it. Whether you think Obamacare is good, bad, or indifferent, we're not gonna necessarily focus on that piece of it. We'll look forward looking at models that might work in terms of meaningful change. So this is your quiz for the morning. Uh, you can do this by yourself. You can do it with your neighbor. Since we're not in an official class, we won't think about cheating or anything like that. So look at these numbers and tell me, tell, decide what you think they represent. So I'll be quiet for a minute. You look at all these numbers and then we'll come back and talk about what you think these numbers represent. And they're all related to healthcare in one way or another. You ready to talk about them? Sixteen percent. What did people think sixteen percent stood for? Somebody shout out an answer. <laughs> percent uninsured in the United States. Yes. Yeah. And Wyoming is not that much different. Uh, depending on when you look at the numbers, we're close to that piece of it. Seventeen point nine percent and nineteen point six percent. Any ideas? 
Yes. This is 17.9 is the percent GDP in 2011 or 2012. I'll have to look at the chart to remember which year. The 19.6 is the percent GDP projected for 2020, um, which is unbelievable. That means 20% of our GDP uh, national health would, would be accounted for in national health care expenditures. You're in the right business. Yeah, yes, that, that's a good piece of it. Um, Four and 2.3, this is an obscure set couple numbers here, but very, very important. This actually represents the number of workers per Medicare beneficiary. The four is in 2000. The 2.3 is in 2020, I believe, or 2030. Yes, this is one of the more sobering numbers. This is, again, the number of workers per Medicare beneficiary. And that's important when you think about how we fund health care, how we fund Medicare specifically. This is another obscure one, but an important one, 53,000. Any random guesses about what that might represent? <laughs> <laughs> we wish that was the population in Wyoming, many of us, yes. Not the population insured. This is actually the number of people in the United States who are over the age of 100. Yeah, pretty amazing. This one might be the most easy to figure out, 7,910. Per capita, yes. This is per capita health care expenditures in the United States. And we'll look at that in just a second. Another somewhat obscure one, 6 to 8%. Any random ideas about what that might be? Actually, it's the percent of our national health expenditures that go towards primary care, specifically. Yeah, that's a sobering one. It's not very much, is it? So let's, I'll look through the data real quick. This is our, again, sort of getting our angst about health care out of our system. This is uninsured rates among non-elderly adults. Uh, you'll see in Wyoming we run upwards of 20%. This was in 2010, 2011. Um, so pretty impressive. This is our national health care expenditures over time. Let me get my little thing out here. Uh, if, you, if you're old enough, you remember here, 1960, uh, 1965 was when Medicare and Medicaid came into place uh, during the Johnson administration. And look what's happened since. Unbelievable uh, growth in terms of costs and percentage of national health care expenditures. This are, these are projections then, um, and you'll see here we have 2012 on this end. Look at 2021. Uh, the projection is that about 20% of our gross domestic product will go to national to health care, um, which is there's no right or wrong size of the pie, but when you think about when the pie is that big, what gets pinched? What other pieces of the pie are smaller than because this piece of the pie gets bigger and bigger? This is that slide I told you about, the number of workers per Medicare beneficiary. We're down to about 3.4 now, um, but we'll get down to 2.3 in 2030, um, and that's very sobering. Uh, for those of us who will be in the Medicare generation in those time periods, that's a sobering number to look at. This is probably the slide that always affects me the most. Um, this is per capita expenditures in the United States and selected developed countries. Now you'll see the United States down here at the bottom of it. We're running about $8,000 per capita in 20, 2010. Now there's the only countries that are close turn out to be Norway and Switzerland at $5,000 per capita. Look how much less many of the other countries are. Now we won't really talk about Italy and 2800. There are probably a lot of reasons why they have only spent 2,800 that might not be good. But look at some of these other countries, Iceland, Ireland, Canada, Belgium, all running about three to 4,000, half of what we spend in our country on national health care expenditures. Now that would, we'd feel better about this number in the United States if our outcomes were better. But as you know, when you, when you line us up with these countries in relation to our outcomes on a variety of different levels, we come out looking worse. Um, we have higher infant mortality rates, um, less satisfaction with our health care system. O on multiple levels, our outcomes are lower. So this, this is an incredibly disturbing number because we're not getting our money back in terms of um, positive outcomes. 
Then this, there isn't a slide that really shows the, prim the percent of our um, health expenditures that goes towards uh, primary care, but this is the physician clinical services part here. So a small chunk of this, this blue chip there is gonna be the part that goes to primary care. Um, so not very much at all. So if you think about it, what we've done in our country is kind of flip this around. We put all of our, we put our money and resources into very specialized care in hospitals, very little in primary care. What we probably need to shift to is a model like this that puts primary care at the base um, and really supports people in terms of health and health promotion. So this is one of my favorite cartoons. Um, it says the US healthcare system, and this guy says, we've tried everything to fix it, but it still won't fly. Um, and I think that nicely captures our current healthcare system. Now we can throw up our hands at this. Um, we can, again, as I said, rant and rave about Obamacare. Um, Obamacare probably fixes maybe a couple things on this airplane, but not a lot. Obamacare does not significantly, as they say, bend the cost curve in terms of healthcare. Um, so Obamacare probably isn't really gonna fix this airplane either, it might do a few things. So what can we do? Are there things that we can do to redesign healthcare in the United States? Um, and again, I'm gonna focus specifically on primary care. I do that in part because I'm a nurse practitioner, so I worked in primary care, um, but it kind of puts it into a, a place that's more manageable than talking about healthcare more broadly. Before talking about some models, um, I want to present to you something called the Triple Aim. This is coming out of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and it describes an approach for really optimizing health uh, system performance, and it focuses on these three, three things down here. Improving the patient experience of care, thinking about that from the perspective of quality and satisfaction both. Um, improving the health of populations. We really want to make certain that the patient goes into the hospital, has a good experience, comes out with the right outcome. Um, but that also then affects the population's health, so that key mortality rates, for example, are lower as well. So we want it at the individual level, but also at the um, community level and population level as well. And again, back to the importance in the United States, we have to think about this in relation to costs per, um, per uh, capita. Uh, our costs are so excessively high. We need to think about these in light of costs as well. So we wanna be able to, when we think about redesigning the healthcare system, we wanna think about all three of these um, areas. Now, when you look at primary care, are there some models that are beginning to help us get at that triple aim? I'm gonna present uh, four different, five different ones to you. Some of these are newer, some of these are a bit older, um, some of these are fairly innovative. Um, all of them that I chose, I think, have some relevance to the state of Wyoming in one way or another. Um, hopefully, they'll, that will stimulate some good conversation about what they, they may mean for yours. I will look a little bit at outcomes, I could, we could do a whole talk on just one of these models and tell you about the research base that's in place um, in relation to them, but I'll highlight a few things about each of them. Now, some of you may be more interested in the patient-centered medical home. Uh, this is really sweeping across the country in a lot of ways, um, in part because of changes instituted in Obamacare and other kinds of national initiatives. This is, I'm using this particular model. There's lots of them that have looked at PCMH models. This happens to come from this TransformEd, which is a, um, an affiliate of the American, the Association of, the Academy of Family Medicine Physicians, and they're working with practices in the state of Wyoming. So this is their model, and they focus on a number of key parts of this. So they look at access and information. Uh, that's important if you're gonna have a patient-centered medical home. You have to have practice-based uh, services, comprehensive care, prevention and, and screening, things like that. This is not something you typically get in a primary practice now, but they're building in care management, particularly for chronically ill patients. So it isn't this that you come in once or twice a year to see the physician or nurse practitioner. You actually have somebody who's working with you, checking in with you, how are you doing, how are your blood sugars, things like that. Care coordination down here, connecting with other services in the community, making sure we've got the person um, connected to the, all the right places. Uh, very clear that there needs to be a practice-based care team. Um, and this can be a variety of different people. 
Now this particular group, it comes out of family medicine, so they talk about this typically under the leadership of a physician. As a nurse practitioner, I will tell you that we see that differently. We, could, we see that nurse practitioners can play that role. But this team should really have a variety of people on it. Physicians, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, social workers, uh, dietitians. It can be a variety of different people depending on the population base. Uh, the practice in a PCMH model should have a very clear focus on quality and safety. That should be embedded in the organization. They should have some sort of a health information technology system as well. And then fact, uh, finally, there's a whole bunch in terms of practice management, making sure that that practice site is well run as well. So that's a broad framework un for under which PCMH models are coming into being. Um, They'll vary depending on the site, depending on the patient load, but that gives you sort of a sense of the components of a PCMH model. Now in Wyoming, as I said, this is the one that's really taken um, hold, and there are lots of practices. Each of these little blue things with a house in it, that's a site that's got a PCMH model um, in a primary care clinic. Um, so they're all over the state at this particular point in time. So what do we know about the evidence related to PCMH? Uh, there was a, an integrative review put out recently, uh, I think 2012, um, that looked at all these different factors, improving quality of care, reducing costs of care, improving the patient and caregiver experience, and then improving professional experience on top of it. Now the conclusion was that some of the results are promising, um, overall, most of them are inconclusive at this particular point in time. Uh, there are some improvements in cost and service, but those are probably going to be concentrated among uh, sites that are seeing quite sick patients. It makes sense when you think about it. If I'm a healthy 35-year-old, um, we'll pretend I'm a healthy 35-year-old, um, and all I get is a, you know, occasional sinus infection once every couple years and I need an annual exam. I really don't need a lot of care coordination. I don't need a social worker to follow my case or a nurse to check in with me. So it's going to be those sicker patients. Now if I'm a 35 year old with diabetes and I've got hypertension and some overlying depression, then a case that sort of added care probably will benefit my outcomes. Um, so let's look at another slide. Now this just actually came out in the last week, about just about a week ago, so I quickly added this slide in, slide in again. The most recent evidence, this was a study done by Friedberg, who's done quite a bit on primary care. They had pilot practices doing PCMH across the country. Now the good thing is the pilot practices were able to implement the PCMH model. They could put this model into place. Um, but interestingly, and I highlighted this part right here, when they looked at the quality measures, those Practices that integrated the PCMH model into their practices only improved in one out of 11 quality measures, and it had to do with screening in diabetes, nephropathy screening in diabetes, um, which again raises the flag of is this a model that's going to help us or not. Pilot project participation was not associated with significant changes in utilization of, utilization of care or costs of care, either one. So this, was, this sort of article has kind of shook everybody this week. What does this mean? Because we're pushing PCMH, PCMH models all across the country. I put up a quote here from, free, uh, from a person who wrote an editorial related to this particular um, study. This person wrote, the study by Friedberg et al. has done a great service for advocates of the PCMH by effectively ending promotion of this care model as a generic, low-level, unselective approach to healthcare delivery for all. The, re the next critical phase of PCMH development should focus on its strategic deployment for the care of high utilization patients with multiple chronic comorbidities, frequently with concomitant mental illness, and often with poor social support. A biomedical technology of this potential power and cost should be targeted in its most intense form to the care of a small and expensive subset of the broad population of primary care patients with the benefits of lower intensive application flowing to all patients. If we improve care for these really complicated patients, that probably actually improves care for those that are less intense. Um, just through the practice improvement approach. So this is a, although those results are sobering, it makes sense. We, there's nothing probably wrong with the PCMH model. We need to think about who to target it to um, when we implement it. 
I'm going to briefly mention something called nurse managed health centers. We don't have a lot of these in Wyoming. There are, there's quite a few on the East Coast. Uh, these are, um, there's not as much of a sort of a consistent framework for a nurse managed health center, but they do tend to focus on health at the neighborhood level. They connect the dots. They're very linked with social services uh, within communities. Uh, often target underserved populations. They emphasize health promotion significantly. They tend to be in non-traditional uh, settings, community-based settings. So you'll see nurse managed centers in schools, uh, big senior housing units in a big city. Um, and they typically are run by nurse practitioners. Um, they may have others on the staff, they may have physicians, pharmacists and other on the staff, but they're typically run by a nurse practitioner. And they actually have some interesting outcomes coming out. These were part, the uh, nurse managed health centers were um, included in the ACA and the Obamacare. Um, there's increased funding for these centers. So when you look at their outcomes, it's pretty good. You can see that a worksite clinic run by a single nurse practitioner resulted in a fairly substantial cost saving um, over a two year period of time. Clinics run by nurse practitioners can create cost savings through, a use, through reduced use of an emergency room, urgent care centers, and hospitals. And nurse managed clinic patients have higher rates of generic uh, medication fills at pharmacies and lower rates of hospitalizations. So although this is a very, um, a lot fewer of these, there are fewer of them across the country, we don't have any in Wyoming, they actually have a fair amount of potential for our state as well. Now this slide relates back to both of these two models. This is an interesting study that came out uh, in 2013. It looked at the impact. One of the worries in primary care is this impending possible shortage of primary care physicians. And what are we going to do about that? Well, when you look at these two models, both PCMH and the nurse managed health centers, um, you can see that when you look at how those use providers, where you have a greater mix of nurse practitioners and PAs, it actually shows that we can handle most of the projected shortage of, of primary care physicians through an alteration in the kind of mix of workers that we're using in primary care. Um, this may require uh, some liberalization of scope of practice laws and payment changes, depending on the state and the area. But this is good news for us, again, in a state like Wyoming. We have lots of physician's assistants and nurse practitioners in the state of Wyoming. And looking at different configurations and different ways to use them could actually enhance our public health system. We are fortunate, I will add, um, in terms of scope of practice. We are a state that has very liberalized scope of practice laws for nurse practitioners. Nurse practitioners can practice completely independent in the state of Wyoming, um, and that's good. Some people won't agree with me on that, but I think it's actually a very good thing. People in, a, in primary care should be able to practice to the full extent of their practice and education. I want to switch. So those are two models. I'm going to switch to a very different one. This one is a fascinating clinic. Uh, three of my faculty went up to visit it last summer and came back and are still raving about it. Uh, this one really um, makes me stop and think very differently about healthcare. This is a clinic up in Alaska, South Central Foundation. It is an Alaska native owned clinic. Um, those receiving services are customer owners and they are very clear about this. They do not call the people who come to their clinic patients or clients or anything else. They are customer owners. And what's interesting is that they have really taken this a long way. Those people are actually shareholders in the clinic. So talk about a very different business model from what we think about um, normally in a primary care setting. This one flips it completely upside down. So on top of that, making the patients the actual customer owners of the clinic, they've also then really brought in cultural components that make this a very different clinic. Their core product, they say, is relationships, and they're very clear about that in their literature. We are, as a clinic, all about relationships. Um, and they, this is a thing from one of the articles about it. Alaska Native leadership recognize that the core product is something bigger than just tests, diagnoses, pills, and procedures. It's about human beings and relationships. Messy, human, longitudinal, personal, trusting, informing, respecting, and accountable relationships. And this is infused throughout the clinic, um, very much so. 
Now the components, they call this the NUCA model, and if, I can't remember what NUCA means. There's a, it means something and I've forgotten it. But this, these are the components of what they call the NUCA model. The first one is, and it fits back with this notion that these are customer owners in the clinic. The customer drives everything. Um, so the clinic team provides expertise, options, recommendations, but it is the customer owner who makes the decision about their care. And they, again, very, very clear about that piece of it. All customers deserve to have a healthcare team that they know and trust. So they have these um, quite extensive teams and patients then are a part of that team as well. And consistent with what I said earlier, all team members uh, function at the top of their skill level as well. Customers should face no barriers when seeking care. So they do a lot with same day scheduling. If I wake up in the morning and don't feel well, I can pick up the phone and get in that same day to be seen by somebody. They also use an, a lot of alternate forms of communication, uh, things like email, for example, um, that are coming into being, but still a little bit of hesitancy about use of that with patients. But they embrace that kind of alternate communication. And then they also, what's embedded into this organization is a, a really strong orientation towards education. Staff members and supporting infrastructure are vital to their success. So they spend a lot on education of their employees at all levels, all the way from someone who may be an aide or a medical technician, all the way up to physicians and nurses um, and pharmacists in that practice. Um, so a real sort of learning community type approach. Now again, you could say, does this mean anything? Well, they have some pretty impressive outcomes. This is what they tout about what they're doing. They decreased utilization in urgent care and emergency departments by 40%, specialists by 50%, and hospital use by 30%. Now think back to that triple aim we were talking about. Um, this is a phenomenal statistic to look at. Uh, their quality is good, 75% 75, 75 of their HEDIS, and these are a set of national standards, are at the 75% or over, and many are at the 95% level. Access, they've had pretty tremendous impact on access. So they had a huge wait list in their behavioral health unit when they first started. The NUCA model, it's down, it was down to zero in one year. 95% um, of the people now designate, have a, they have a primary care provider. Um, prior to the NUCA model coming into place, when, they, when you interviewed people in that community, only 35% said that they had a primary care provider. And that's an important thing. Um, just because you have a primary care provider doesn't mean you're going to get the care that you need um, or that you're going to use it, but it's a huge difference. If somebody does not identify that they have a primary care physician, provider of some sort, their access is going to be much more restricted. And those of you who have at some point not had a provider can testify to that piece of it. So this is important for people to be able to say that they've got somebody. And their wait time for routine appointment decreased from four weeks down to a same day. Customer satisfaction is great, and staff satisfaction is also tremendous on top of it. So when you go back to that triple aim, some of these models really are beginning to hit all three of those in some very productive ways. This is a slightly different one, and I added it in here in part because UW is just forming a partnership in relation to Project ECHO. It's a bit different in the sense that it does not provide direct patient care services as part of the project itself. This is a model that's all about building capacity in primary care and building capacity in rural health systems. Uh, the University of Wyoming has signed an agreement in the last month or two with the University of New Mexico that runs this particular project. And we will be starting some Project ECHO uh, projects in the state of Wyoming. The first one is coming out of WIND, which is the Wyoming Institute for Disabilities. And it's actually going to be, if I understand it correctly, a school-based project. Um, and that'll make a little bit more sense when I walk through what this particular project does. This is really sort of a phenomenal way to connect um, um, care for rural complex um, uh, diseases with specialty care in other areas. It's a fascinating model. So what happens in ECHO, um, it's, it's really rather straightforward. They train and support primary care providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, from underserved areas to develop knowledge and self-efficacy so that they can deliver a complex care, care to complex health conditions. Um, Community providers, providers take part in a weekly clinic called Knowledge Networks. Um, they join a video conference, and in these video conferences, the primary care folks from wherever in that state um, 
present their cases. They talk about who they're seeing in clinical practice. The specialists then provide advice and mentoring. Again, the specialists are not actually seeing um, the patients. It's the primary care people bringing these patients to them. They focus on evidence-based practice protocols, and at times, if need be, the specialists will provide some short presentations. Maybe there's a new um, antiviral medication out, and they present a bit of an overview on that particular medication. So in the end, what Project ECHO is about is what they call learning loops. It's this shared mutual learning and decision making between specialists and primary care to enhance access to care in rural areas. Again, some interesting outcomes. This is a study published. The very first ECHO project actually was in relation to hepatitis C virus. Um, specialist, uh, this Dr. Aurora, is a gastroenterologist who specializes in hepatitis. So they randomly assigned people to be in the Project ECHO group and then a group to be and just receive normal care through the specialist as they'd done before. It's interesting because when you look at their, res their viral response rate in hepatitis C, it was no different between those seen at the University of New Mexico by the specialist and those that were seen, again, by physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs in a variety of primary care settings. Interestingly enough, actually, the adverse events were higher in specialty care than they were in primary care. Much fewer um, adverse events for those being treated by, again, primary care people supported through this learning loop by a specialist to care for more complicated, chronically ill patients. So they started in hepatitis C, but they've gone way beyond that now. They're doing fascinating projects in all kinds of different areas, including things um, like uh, mental health kinds of things, and they have a project in India, I believe now, focused on something related to attention deficit or something like that. Um, anyway, they have really expanded this particular model. Again, relevant to, very relevant to us in an isolated rural state. Um, this is something that could work for us here. Now, the last thing I wanted to present before we uh, spend a little time talking about things is something called value-based primary care. I don't have outcomes on this particular model. This is a theoretical model. This comes out of some work of Michael Porter from Harvard Business School. Um, so I, I brought it in to bring in a business perspective. You've seen models developed by physicians and nurses. You've seen models developed develop very much with the, with the customer owner right involved in it. You've seen models developed by specialists in healthcare. This is one that comes out of a business perspective. Um, so Michael Porter and his colleagues write, ironically, the only way to improve value in primary care is to recognize that primary care is the wrong unit of analysis. We must deconstruct primary care, which is not a single set of services, but a group of services delivered to meet the different needs of multiple subgroups of patients. So he's very much into not primary care as some monolithic thing, primary care as different parts of it. You can have very healthy young children in a primary care practice. You can have children with chronic illness in a primary care practice. And they're different, and their needs are different, and therefore we need to target primary care in different ways to those two different populations. Some of you, this, was, this book was put out in 2006. Some of you may have read it. This is where Michael Porter's original work came from. He put out a book called Redesigning Healthcare, Creating Value-Based Competition on Results. And this is the core components of what he said competition and value in healthcare um, require. The focus should be on value for patients, not just lowering costs, although later on you'll see that he very much emphasizes costs. Competition must be based on results. Um, again, thinking back to the triple aim, we've got to have the outcomes there in front of us. Competition should center on health conditions over the full cycle of care. Um, this, is, this is this notion that it shouldn't be, those of you who've had surgery, I guess that's probably the best example. Those of you that have had surgery, you get bills from everybody and their mother, and they come for years. And three years after the surgery, a bill arrives from an anesthesiologist that you never even knew that you saw because you were, of course, put out at the time. Um, so this notion is that we should be billing across that. There should be one bill for that. You have a cholecystectomy and you pay $20,000. And how that $20,000 gets divvied up between the surgeon and the radiologist and the anesthesiologist and the facility and the nursing care that was provided, any medications that you might have gotten, it's up to them in the building to figure that out. 
um, you just pay one bill or your insurance company pays one bill. And Michael Porter strongly advocates for that type of billing. Uh, health quality care should be less costly. Again, he wants to focus on clear outcomes, but we also need to have less costly care as well. Value must be driven by provider experience, scale, and learning at the medical condition level. This is an interesting for us, for us in the state of Wyoming. In this book, he centers a lot on acute care, and he tells, he really advocates for hospitals like MD Anderson, their big cancer center, for example. That's all they do is cancer, and they're great at it. And that sounds good if you're in Texas. Um, I can't remember where MD Anderson is. Is that Dallas? Um, Houston? Thank you. Um, you know, if that's great if you're Houston, but if you're in Rollins, Wyoming, you couldn't have MD Anderson there. We're too small. Um, so how to make this work where we can focus on medical conditions within healthcare is a bit challenging, but we'll get back to that in relation to how he sees that in primary care. Competition should be regional and national, not just local. Um, so a hospital in Laramie, Wyoming ought to be able to compete with hospitals all over the Rocky Mountain region and potentially with um, hospitals nationally as well. Results information to support value-based competition must be widely available. This is the focus on transparency that many of you have probably read about in relation to healthcare. And then innovations that increase value must be strongly um, re re reinforced. Um, and this is something I think has probably been a challenge for us in healthcare. We're very hierarchical and we do things because we've done them. Um, I've, been, uh, my, I've been telling people my um, grandmother was a nurse in World War I and I've over the last couple of years gotten more and more fascinated about it. And I've read quite a bit about it and it is striking to me how much that she did in World War I in 1918 looks a heck of a lot like what we're doing now in 2014 as well. So innovation can be a challenge, I think, in a, in a setting where we, again, are very traditional, very hierarchical. So Porter sees a fundamental flaw in primary care. It's impractical to measure outcomes achieved relative to costs for very diverse sets of patients. As I said, you're seeing young and old, sick and not sick. Um, in one day, if you're a primary care practitioner, you may be seeing a 15-year-old who's come in for a sports physical for the fall. The next person that comes is a 92-year-old woman who looks like she may have pneumonia. The next patient is a 23-year-old who fell down the stairs that morning and sprained her ankle. That kind of diversity in patients, it's hard to say what is the standard set of outcomes for that group of diverse patients. So we default to performance, met to performance metrics. Um, based on what physicians and other primary care providers do. So it's volume of visit, panel size, number of procedures executed, because we can measure that piece of it. But that becomes problematic, obviously. So as a result, primary care practices have become sub supply-based organizations designed to maximize the production of services through the number of visits and fee-for-service reimbursement for what are really discrete transactions. You come in, I evaluate you, we take your blood pressure, maybe we draw some blood, I send you a home with a prescription. It's this discrete set of actions and the more I do those, the more I get paid, whether you feel better or not. Um, and this is the fundamental flaw from Porter's perspective in primary care. So he took those things that he, that I, the, the book that I uh, re re briefly referenced, he took those components and has translated them into what um, can be value-based primary care. So he says primary care should be organized around subgroups of patients with similar needs, not diagnoses, but patients who have similar types of care needs. So like I said, it may be this pod over here sees patients who are um, under the age of 18 and who are generally healthy. This group over here sees those who are under age 18 but have significant chronic illness. This group sees women who are in their childbearing ages who have a common set of care needs around that. This, this pod over here in the practice sees those who are older adults with chronic illness. This pod may see older adults who are actually quite healthy. Um, so he argues, again, to take away primary care as being the overall, it's these subgroups that become the important piece of it. As you've seen in all these models, he focuses a lot on team-based services. They should be provided to each uh, subgroup of patients over the full cycle of their care um, as well. Each patient's outcomes and true costs should be measured by the subgroup. 
um, as a very routine part of care. And when you put these into to groups that are more alike, you can begin to think about outcomes that you could consistently measure as well. Payment should be modified. He actually argues for a bundled payment mechanism. It's interesting when you read this particular um, article that he put out just recently, he actually advocates for something where for the group of patients that are very healthy, that the young, the children that are healthy, the practice be paid, say, $5 a month for that. For the group that's got a little bit more, they're paid $10 a month. For the other group, they're paid $15. So it's, it's just on a monthly basis. Now, if a person has an acute care situation, they had to be hospitalized with an appendicitis, there could be a diff additional reimbursement for that piece of it. But for their a average care, it's a simple flat monthly um, rate. Primary care patient subgroup team should be integrated with specialty providers. So again, a bit like the ECHO model, he argues for pulling specialists in. So instead of having primary care over there and specialty way over there, we integrate those in. And that, again, for the healthy children, we probably don't have to have a lot of specialists. When you think about a, a group, a subgroup that may be older patients with lots of comorbidities, you might need to have an endocrinologist, a, cardio, a cardiologist, and those specialists become part of that primary care team as well. Now again, there's no outcomes. This is a theoretical model, um, but I give it because again, it gives a very different sort of perspective on what primary care might look like. So I'm going to stop for a couple minutes. I want to get some of your reactions to all of this. What does this mean for primary care in Wyoming? So think back to this, this idea of the triple aim. This is where we want to get we want, to have, um, we want to have system changes in the state of Wyoming that positively affect population health, positively affect the patient's experience, meaning they are satisfied with the care they get and they have a quality outcome. Um, and we need to think about per capita costs, one of the most important pieces. Now I've presented several different models. These are not all that there are in the world, but again, they're ones I think are relevant to us. Um, I put this up here simply to get us thinking about it. This is what primary care looks like now. This person has a variety of different illnesses. They're seen by all these people. There's lines going everywhere. You just, the, many of you have probably experienced that. You go to the primary care person, you're bounced over there, then you're over here, then you're back in here, then you, it's that. How could we have primary care look something like this? So I'm gonna stop for a minute. Thoughts, comments, or questions? Good. I'm gonna go to the back first because he had his hand up first. Uh. You've also presented a, a number of solutions, uh, positive alternatives to the problem we're in now. How do these solutions become implemented? Are they mandated by different states? Uh, how do you make these happen? Good question. I, I'm, I'm pausing for a second because I suspect Oh, answer. He asked, how do we, with these kind of innovations, the solutions that I've presented here, how would we implement those? Would it be something that becomes mandated by a state? Um, would there be other ways to implement it? I suspect part of that answer will depend on the person you ask it to. Um, depending on where you're at on the political spectrum, you would say absolutely no to a state mandating these kinds of things. Um, I think, from my perspective, this needs to come from us within healthcare and also from pressure from outside of healthcare, from all of you coming in demanding this type of care. We could certainly mandate it and states could do that, but I actually think the more effective way will be coming up through healthcare itself with incredible pressure from all of you as consumers. Think of yourself in the NUCA model as the customer owner and put that kind of pressure on your primary care clinic. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Sort of. Um, the thing that distresses me is, like Americans, we're all reinventing uh, the wheel here. If we look at your first chart or your second chart that shows the rest of the world has about half the cost that we have, and their outcomes are better, I understand there's a study out that said of 27 major developed countries, we stand 25th on in outcomes. So why, why in your study do you not study what they do in France and Scandinavia and some of these countries? Why, you know, I don't want to throw water on you, uh, but 
typically you're studying new solutions where other people have, they've studied it and they have a better system now than reinventing this. And then we have the problem, even if we invented something as good as theirs, how do we implement it, which was the first question. Yeah, the question who was... Studying, oh. All right, let me think. Yes. <laughs> who is studying? <laughs> who is studying what other people do that would give us better results? Yes, the question was, why are, we not, why are we just looking at models from the United States? There are other countries who have been very, very successful. Um, and I would recommend to all of you, if you've not read it, read T.R. Reed's book. Um, oh, I'm going to blank on the exact title. It's about uh, caring healthcare in America or something. If you Google T.R. Reed and put healthcare up, will pop his book. He actually does a fascinating study. He uses an, an old shoulder injury and goes around to 10, I believe, different countries and introduces himself into the healthcare system with the shoulder industry to injury to see what they'll do. And it is absolutely fascinating. Of course, what would, have, what would be your guess for what he was recommended when he went to see somebody in the United States about his surgery, surgery and actually a shoulder replacement? Interesting enough, when he went to a site in France, they recommended, he went to a super, super specialist and they said, you just need physical therapy. Um, and he went and got physical therapy. Actually, his best experience was in India, where he got to go and spend a week in an Ayurvedic hospital, where they did massage and all kinds of incredible stuff. So yes, there are models out there that work. I think politically in the United States, we have been very uncomfortable in looking outward. We have been uh, downright negative about other countries, um, which is unfortunate because we have a lot to learn. The models that I've presented to you are primarily, I would call, US models, but they're not unlike models in other countries. The PCMH model, for example, you will see similar kinds of things in other countries. So I've focused on the US part of them, but they have international pieces to it as well. Um, so I do, again, I, I hear what you're saying. We need to look at models outside of the United States as well. Realization on behalf of the healthcare provider first, and then pressure coming from users. Well, we live in Wyoming, and we watch our legislature. And that's our outlook. And they are going to do anything to address the issues. So, are we stuck? No, I don't. The question was, we live in Wyoming, and we have a, I'll put this in the politically correct terms, we have a conservative legislature. Um, where they're not probably going to, you were asking about should this be mandated by the state, for example. Our legislature is probably not going to do something like that. So are we stuck? And I would say no, I don't think so. You can look at the development of PCMH models, the nurse managed health centers. In fact, they may be one of the best models. Nurse managed health centers grew up completely outside of any sort of state or federal um, <coughs> mandate or even support. It's only been in the last couple years that they've come into being as a model supported now by federal dollars through some funds in the ACA, for example. So I think that kind of innovation and work can occur without having state or federal pressure to get there. Depending again on where you're at politically, you might appreciate that part of it. You might want to have that state mandate or federal mandate, but in a state where that's not likely to happen, we can still make changes, I think. Yes, so he asked about, is there an insurance company in all these models? Absolutely, um, they're not necessarily driving or running that model, but they directly. But they are going to be the one of the key payment sources. So PCMH, the, the nurse managed health centers, the NUCA model, all of these are paid for like primary care is paid for. Medicare dollars, Medicaid, third party payers like Blue Cross Blue Shield. They're going to have uninsured folks that they either write off or have on a sliding scale. So yes, the insurance companies will be there and partner with them as well. You did a great job presenting uh, alternatives. I have a question about the per capita. That's, a, that's an aggregation of numbers. Mm -hmm. and when you aggregate numbers, you, I'm always skeptical. So I'm wondering if anybody has taken the US number and pulled it out various things and broken it down. For example, uh, end of life care is very expensive. 
how is that treated in the United States versus how is it treated in other countries? Per capita cost, which is very high in the United States, that's a total. So that's everything. That's hospital care, um, drug costs, um, devices, if you've, you've gotten a wheelchair, potentially personal care in the home. It's all of that lumped together in one big amount. Has anybody disaggregated that and looked at, so for the United States, end of loss care, England, end of life care, um, Italy, end of life care, or whatever. I will preface my remarks by saying I'm not an economist, so I'm probably not the best person to answer the total question, but um, we could get Ann Alexander back and she could do a better job. Yes, there are some that disaggregate those. There's an interesting, I didn't present that data, there's an interesting one that looks at uh, drug, co drug costs. Amazing, again, same actual pattern, it's no different. Our drug costs are tremendously higher in the United States. Again, compared to um, relative developed countries, like on that particular slide. As to things like end-of-life care, I suspect there are, but I don't know that. It's not something I've looked at. Um, but there has been some disaggregation of those costs. And we are different um, than other countries as well. Let's go over to there. Yeah. Uh, my father had a small business. The question was, what accounts for that unbelievable increase in overall health care costs for the United States? Um, we think of things, one of the things that's been one of the hotbed uh, uh, topics on this is what role does um, uh, tort reform lawsuits, malpractice play into that? That tends to be a very small, account for a very small percentage of that dramatic increase in costs. Some of it is due to the change, as I, so, I showed you that number, we have 50 some thousand people who are over the age of 100. Um, so when you think about the aging of our population, that accounts for some of it. Our, demographic, our demographics have changed fairly significantly. And what comes with being an older person then is typically some higher need for care. Um, so that's partly responsible for some of those costs. Clearly inflation would be a piece of that. Again, I'm not an economist, so I don't know how that all quite plays out. Interesting enough though, when you look at the United States, I suspect what accounts for some of the biggest component of it is the way we go about providing care. Um, we provide high-tech expensive care. We, we love that kind of thing. So we're absolutely fascinated by our ability to take out somebody's heart and put a new heart in. And that's wonderful, and I'm not actually criticizing that. But as I said, when you look at that inverted pyramid, we put our resources into expensive care. We put our resources into drugs, devices, technology that other countries actually constrain more than we do. So we put our healthcare dollars into expensive types of healthcare. We don't put it into primary care, uh, public health, where the focus is on maintaining people's health, improving their health, and hopefully improving their quali quality of life and decreasing healthcare costs on top of it. So we have a very expensive type of healthcare. And if you look at physician salaries, for example, in the United States versus other countries, our salaries are way, way higher as well. So we drive a very expensive healthcare system. Does that make sense? In the back, in the black there. How did they get to the ownership component of the NUCA? I can't answer that question for you. I should have one of my faculty here who went up. Um, this was in part, those of you who've worked with uh, Native American tribes, uh, there was a time when IHS would come in and provide those services, but in the 80s and 90s, the IHS began giving those funds directly to the tribes for them to run their own healthcare systems. It was part of a move towards self-governance. That's when this model came into place, was during that drive. So it had to do with a part of that, the specifics of it, I could not tell you, unfortunately. So all of these primary care models, I think, have certain merits. However, I think Michael Porter, in a way, uh, hit the nail on the head uh, with the fee-for-service type of payments to this country. And having been through that whole cycle from the very beginning of Medicare and to answer one of the questions that was posed here, was Medicare, at least when they initially came out, 
paid for everything. And because doctors and hospitals and imaging centers and surgical centers uh, could charge on a fee-for-service basis and be paid, uh, they began doing so. And it became a, like a snowball rolling down the hill. And more and more got added to the cost of the bill. And it was because of fee-for-service. Uh, and at least in my uh, experience, it would seem that if you did this bundling of charges, you would have far less <coughs> cost escalation and far more attention to the disease process rather than the well, yeah. you know, It's fee-for-service drives you to do stuff. The more you do, the more you get. Um, no matter what, if what you do is good or not, the more you do, the more you get. We have to do something different. And Michael Porter's approach, which is not, there are a number of people advocating for this, this bundled billing um, is probably the way we need to go because it de-emphasizes doing lots of stuff just for the sake of doing it. It emphasizes getting the right care to the right person at the right time so you get the kind of outcome you need without necessarily escalating costs, which I firmly believe. I really do think we're going to have to get away completely from fee-for-service models, not only in primary care, but other parts of health care as well. I'm seeing Paul walk down the hall. Thank you very much, <laughs> Let me just give my, I have to give my challenge. I'll finish on this particular note. This is Don, many of you may have read Don Berwick's stuff. He's sort of one of the thought leaders in healthcare. He was the um, executive in the CMS, Centers of Medicaid and Medisur Medicare Services, for a short period of time, but couldn't get through uh, Congress to be approved. As he was leaving uh, CMS, he challenged his, the people at, in CMS. He said, let me put it simply, in this room with the successes already in hand among you, you collectively have enough knowledge to rescue American health care, hands down, better care, better health, lower costs. The only question left is, will you do it? And I give that challenge to all of us in this room. I think we have what it takes to change it. Will we do it? Um, thank you very much. <laughs>